Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and being inside on this super sunny Seattle day. I'm Rachel Bell. I host the podcast, Your Last Meal. Give myself a little plug. It is a James Beard finalist for Best Podcast. We have a new episode out today with the uh, writer of Bridgerton. And for today's KCTS 9's Food for Thought series, we're doing Pie Squared because, of course, on Sunday, it is March 14th, 3.14 pie. So today you're going to learn everything you ever wanted to know about pie and pizza. So we have the region's foremost pie experts ranging from pie to pizza. So just know that we're going to do a brief audience Q&A at the end of the event. So if you have a question that you are inspired to ask while we're talking, uh, make sure and get that in the chat. We're going to keep track of those and we'll get to as many of them as possible. I also want to remind you before we get started that KCTS 9 is a nonprofit and events like this are only possible because of the support of viewers like you. So thank you to everybody who has donated. Uh, if you would like to become a member or make a donation, you can do that at kcts9.org slash support. Um, and also everybody that's here today that you're going to hear from has either a book or a restaurant and all of that is linked below. So you can easily buy one of those books and probably order a pizza while they're talking so that that can be delivered when this is done. Um, so make sure and check that out at the end of the event. Of course, um, all of these authors and restaurateurs are small businesses and could use your support right now more than ever. So I want to um, introduce everybody right now. I don't know why, but I'm going to call you the Brat Pack of Pie Makers. Um, and these guys are coming from all over the state. So we have Seattle represented. We have Spokane. We have Port Angeles. Um, I will just go through and introduce everybody. So Lauren Co, also known as Loco Kitchen on Instagram. She is the author of the cookbook Pieometry that came out not so long ago. Uh, we have Kate McDermott, who's a pie teacher and a cookbook author of several books, including Art of Pie and Pie Camp. Uh, Kate Lebo, she is a poet, a pie maker. I just love popping the peas on my microphone here. Um, also the author of many books. Her newest is The Book of Difficult Fruit, which has already been praised in the New York Times by Samin Nasrat as a dazzling, thorny new essay collection. That's good to hear. And then no offense to everyone I just mentioned, but my personal favorite pie is the pizza pie. So uh, we brought in Dave Lichterman to represent pepperoni, etc. He's the owner of Windy City Pie and one of my favorite pizza places in town, Breezy Town. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to um, chat with each person individually for a little bit. And then we're going to open it up and talk all pie related things. Anyone can jump in uh, and then we'll do the Q&A. So I'm going to start with Dave um, because he is the the odd man out here. Um, when you opened Windy City, which I believe was in 2015, you were an enigma. I mean, people still tell stories about you because you were the only employee. You made all the pies and you delivered them. There's these stories of you meeting people in dark alleyways. So could you tell the story of how you went from being an engineer to a pizza person and why you started making pizzas in your condo. Yeah. So um, first of all, those were really fun days. I knew everybody's name and face. Um, you know, I knew if people were first timers, I knew if, you know, they dined, dined with us, you know, and times, whatever. Um, so restaurants are real hard to make work financially. And I just wanted to determine the viability at that point. Like I needed to know that my friends weren't kind of blowing smoke up my butt saying, oh, your pizza's great. You know, you should open a restaurant. I, you know, they're not paying for money for that pizza at that point. I'm just making it for them because I like to share food. Um, so I really wanted to make sure that I wasn't, you know, going to invest all this money in something that, that didn't make sense. Um, you know, didn't actually have a market here in Seattle. Um, and so, you know, I... I was finishing up my career in tech at that point, and I'll get, I probably will get into that more later. I also don't want to talk forever. Um, but uh, instead of just like, you know, going into a kitchen or buying a restaurant or finding a space, also, I had no experience doing any of this stuff. So um, I basically I started making it out of my condo, um, which is totally not legal. Um, <laughs> but you know, 
my my thought was, well, if I deliver all the pizzas myself, then no one's really going to ask a question. They're just going to see a pizza delivery driver that they see every time that they order. Um, and, you know, because you know, pizza gets delivered, you don't like, oh, well, I wonder what the kitchen looks like. You know, people are just like, okay, cool. So and I guess that's kind of like the ghost kitchen idea now. Um, but before it was, you know, had a name. Um, yeah. And I'm going to jump in here. So you make, um, you do Chicago style pies at Windy yeah. City. And then at Breezy Town, you kind of do this combo, like almost your own creation between Detroit and Chicago and your own imagination. Yeah. Uh, and your pizza, I mean, this is impressive. Kenji Lopez Alts, the food writer, said that your Chicago style pie is better than the pizza in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that was, um, so Kenji saying that the lead up to that, that's what actually got me out of my condo because Kenji was uh, talking bad about deep dish pizza um, one day on Twitter. And I, you know, as a fan of his, I was like, no, it, it can be good. And, you know, I reached out to him. I was like, well, you know, you just haven't gone to the right spots. He's like, well, I have, and it's not good. And, was, and then the next day he posts this picture of a pizza he made. And I'm like, well, you're doing these things wrong, um, you know, per what you're probably trying to do. Um, and he's like, well, how do you know? I was like, well, I actually just started a pizza restaurant and he was about to go on his food lab book tour. Um, and he's like, well, you know, I'll, I'll come check out your operation in Seattle. And I'm just looking around my condo like, uh, no, you're not. <laughs> um, that's, that's a bad idea. So I said, sounds like the beginning of some wacky hijinks of a movie where it's like, cut to movie montage, rent a pizza restaurant. Ah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I set, you know, sometime before Kenji arriving as my, well, I need to be out not cooking in my home anymore at that point. And so two days before Kenji arrived, I finally um, got set up in a commissary space. Um, and uh, yeah, he came, tried the pizza and he said it was, said it was awesome, you know. And then I, you know, called my parents from the alley there and, you know, cried and I was like, <laughs> oh my God, he liked it. Um, your which, Sally Field moment. He really yeah, it was just it, it was one of those you know pivotal pivotal moments that um, you know it was basically like well, and the rest is history. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, but we operated out of that kitchen uh, until October 2016, and then we moved into Batch Joe Six, and yeah. So this week was a big week for your pizza because the state of New Jersey yep. called you out on Twitter so random that this happened and they posted one of your pizzas, a picture, was it from Breezy Town? The caption was, this is not pizza. This is a cry for help. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what we're looking at? A lot of people are saying it is burnt because they see dark around the edge and mm -hmm. like a rim of black, like a little volcano crater around the, pe the pepperoni. Defend your pizza, sir. Absolutely. Um, well, the cry for help is that we are hiring. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I've generally always just let word of mouth speak for the pizza, um, uh, you know, because I was so worried about, you know, whether the market was viable. I always just wanted to let word of mouth and not advertising, you know, be our, you know, our biggest advocate. Um, but this did give me kind of an opportunity to address these common misconceptions and initial perceptions around our pizza. Uh, it's not burnt. Um, the edge is the Maillard browning reaction, uh, which is, yes, sorry, uh, is, it's science. Uh, yes, uh, which is a reaction between sugars, amino acids, and heat. Um, and you'll find that same delicious reaction occurring on like a smash burger or the socarrat on uh, paella, things like that. It looks very dark, yes, I am very aware. Um, it's not burnt. Um, and then people were saying, oh, like the pepperoni is greasy. And I don't understand where people are getting this low fat pepperoni that they're expecting. <laughs> yeah. uh, the pepperoni we use uh, has natural casing. So it'll crisp and curl, which is the desired um, effect here. Um, because then when you put uh, Pecorino Romano in it, the grease absorbs into the Pecorino Romano and it's delicious. Um, again, it, it's pizza. I don't know. I, I don't know <laughs> where the uh, the controversy is like it. 
Yeah. Uh, it, well, yeah, it, that's it, what I was going to ask crazy. you because pizza definitely is one of those foods. And one of one of the few, I think, where people have really, really strong opinions um, based on regionality. And a lot of people oh, yeah. hate a certain kind of pizza and love a certain kind of pizza. And people just forget that, you know, it's all opinion, but people like to get mean and angry. And that all came out on Twitter over your, quote, burnt pizza. Right. And so the other thing that um, people will also jump in on is um, whether or not this is Chicago style pizza. And first and foremost, Breezy Town is not meant to ascribe to any particular style of pizza and that's why it's called breezy town because it's kind of a joke on the name windy city pie um but people are like oh you know this is deep dish pizza and it's like well first of all you're not the standards organization of anything um <laughs> you know you just have your own experience but also like gatekeeping around what isn't isn't a certain style is pretty boring um mm -hmm. and, and and limits uh, innovation like if you know if only certain valid styles of pizza were made like then we wouldn't have a lot of styles of pizza that we now have um and so continuing that innovation is is to me you know very a very important thing i didn't open lou malnati's because lou malnati's exists i wanted to do my own thing uh my thing is more of a pequod's pan style deep dish pizza um and you know to think that even in chicago there's only one style of deep pizza is is rather short-sighted um so yeah thanks dave we are going to come back to you so if anybody has any questions about pizza or anything for dave make sure and put those in the comments uh i'm going to move on to lauren so lauren makes these beautiful pies that are not the standard pie that you see you know coming to the thanksgiving table <laughs> they are geometric and colorful and very precise. Um, so I want to start with your story as well, because, you know, kind of like the modern Cinderella story starts on Instagram these days. Um, what were you doing before? Why did you start making pies? And and talk about how you went completely viral in just a matter of months. Yeah, so it's definitely a wild story. So I moved to Seattle with my partner in the, at the end of summer of 2016. And my professional background is in social work and nonprofit administration. I was unemployed at the time, looking for a job, had some extra time on my hands, and stumbled across some really beautiful pictures of pie. I think there were, you know, less than a handful of pie artists back then. Pie was just beginning to have its moment in the like art space. Um, but these pies had like floral cutouts, lots of leaf cutouts, very feminine, romantic kind of aesthetic. Um, not really my style, but they did get me thinking, huh, I've never made a pie. I wonder if I can do it. So I went for it, made my first pie. It was fine. Didn't transform <laughs> my life. I didn't instantly <laughs> change into a pie lady. It's just something that I kind of added to my repertoire of things that I was making for fun on the weekends or weeknights. Um, and then fast forward a year, um, to August of 2017. By that point, I was the executive assistant to the chancellor at Seattle Colleges, just working a standard office desk job. Um, again, baking for fun on the weeknights and weekends just for myself and to feed people that I love. Um, and I started this local kitchen Instagram account because I felt like I was becoming that friend and putting too many food photos in my personal account. And didn't want to be that obnoxious person. So mm -hmm. just to separate some of these photos. Um, and I didn't intend for it to be anything public. It wasn't supposed to be a thing. And it was really going to be a holding place for a variety of things from, you know, summer salads to blueberry muffins to chocolate chip cookies to whatever I was making. Um, but it just so happened that the first photo I uploaded was a geometric peach pie. And almost instantly, I think I got something like a couple hundred likes, which as a regular person totally blew my mind. And I thought, you know, are these trolls? Are these bots? What's happening <laughs> here? Is this fake? Uh, so a couple days later, I posted a photo of a tart that I had made. And again, a couple hundred likes. So I thought, clearly something is happening here. People respond really well to eyes and tarts. So just kind of kept posting and Within a month, I had hit a thousand followers, and uh, by that December, so just a couple months in, I hit a hundred thousand followers, and then I quit my office job because wow, 
something was happening and I wanted to ride the wave and see where it would take me. And three and a half years later, here we are. I do this full time now. So cool. And I just love that you had never even made a pie before. I'm sure that makes some people so mad. <laughs> They're like, yeah, I've been making like, pie for 30 cool. years. Right. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can, which yeah. I feel like there's not a lot of barriers to this. So, so I'm curious about um, what comes first. Do you come up with the design or are you inspired by a fruit or a filling? How do you, what comes first? Yeah, it really depends. Sometimes I'm design driven. So I'll have an idea in my head that I really need to get out on dough or in fruits and vegetables. And then, you know, sometimes it's driven by necessity. So I, for example, have a ton of apples in the house, they're getting kind of wrinkly, and I need to use them up. And that kind of drives, you know, what I make, um, what I'm doing, that kind of thing, or, you know, depends on what's in season, if things are on sale um, at the grocery store, I'll probably buy a bunch of that and um, figure out a pie or a tart around that. Sometimes it's, you know, color driven, I want to make something with these particular colors, how can I make them play nicely together? Um, sometimes it's flavors, that kind of thing. So it, it really depends. Every kind of project is different. Um, and basically what you see in my Instagram is the result of any particular creative session. I don't draw things out. I don't really plan things out in advance. Um, I just kind of get a general idea of where I'm headed and then go for it and see what happens. Yeah, I watched I watched a video of you making pie and talking about it. And I was shocked by that. I watched you cut the kiwis and you didn't have a sketch. You just were cutting them and putting them as you went. And it turned out so perfectly. I was really shocked and impressed by that. <laughs> Thanks. I find that usually if I have a looser idea of what I want to happen, um, I end up happier with the finished product, I think. Mm fruit and vegetables and pie dough don't always cooperate the same way as say pen and paper. Um, and so if I do sketch things out, I tend to be a little bit more frustrated because things don't turn out as precise or exact as I would have yeah. imagined. So in that sense, I just kind of pick a general concept or direction and then go for it. So do your flavor combinations <laughs> always work or do you sometimes compromise that because you really want certain colors and a certain look? Um, I do work really hard to make sure that the flavor combinations work um, because, I mean, I am primarily motivated by the art and design of it, but because I am working with an edible medium and because I share so much of what I make with friends, family, neighbors, it's really important to me that, one, I'm not wasting food, and two, that I'm not feeding somebody something that tastes disgusting. So yeah. it's important that it looks good and also tastes good. Can you talk about some of the ingredients you use to make your colored dough? Yeah, so all of my coloring is all natural. I don't use any sort of artificial coloring. So things like beet powder and beet juice make a really deep, rich magenta. Um, spinach juice, spinach powder obviously makes a green dough. Um, blueberry powder makes a really beautiful purple. Um, and, you know, I have recipes in my book for um orange dough, which I use carrot juice and carrot powder for. And then there's um, butterfly pea flower tea that makes a really bright blue. So you kind of brew this tea from these dried flowers. And then I substitute these juices, um, basically one for one with the water and the dough. What are some of your favorite <laughs> combinations from the book? Um, let's see, my favorite pie from the book is this white carrot miso pie that I pair with a black sesame mm -hmm. crust. So as someone who ironically doesn't have much of a sweet tooth, this is kind of my ideal dessert where it's not very heavy, not super rich, um, not cloyingly sweet. And then that hit of miso brings a nice savory touch, which makes it feel really balanced. And then the black sesame in the crust also gives an extra kind of textural crunch. Um, and I think all of that plays really nicely together and feels very me and the kind of flavor profile that I really enjoy. Oh my God, that sounds so good. Can you name one more pie? I want everyone drooling. Yeah, um, let's see. One of my other favorite ones in the book is a caramelized onion, a caramelized onion, caramelized pineapple. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, and that one is not only delicious, it feels like a pie that's close to my heart because it's inspired by childhood barbecues. So when my family gets together, we have carne asada, lots of steak and salsas and tortillas. And then we always grill pineapple that we sprinkle with cinnamon sugar. 
Mm -hmm. Um, And so logically, the progression was that if this tastes good, it must taste good in a pie. Um, And so in this recipe, the pineapple is grilled with that cinnamon sugar, and then I chop it up, stick it in a pie, bake it, and it has this, you know, it's paired with this crispy, buttery, um, crunchy pie crust. And um, yeah, it's delicious. It looks pretty. And it also feels very nostalgic. I love that. So what are some of your other inspirations, whether it is for the design look, or I love this story, you know, with flavors, where do you pull your ideas from in life? Yeah, uh, the short answer is everywhere. I'm kind of inspired by pretty much everything around me. I have pies and tarts in my Instagram feed and in my book that are inspired by things like bathroom tile, patio furniture, bamboo purses, um, textiles, architecture, basically, you name it. Again, seasonal produce, um, you know, any sort of funky color combinations, that kind of thing. So I basically draw inspiration from pretty much everything, everywhere, and, you know, kind of the environment that surrounds me. I love that. love that. Okay. Well, again, we're going to move on to the next person. But if you have any questions from Lauren, type it, type them into your comment section. Um, okay. Now we're going to go to uh, one of two Kates. I feel like we have to go back to kindergarten where it's we have Kate L and we have Kate M. Uh, so we're going to start with Kate Lebo. Uh, you have an MFA in poetry and you are a pie maker and an essayist. Um, first of all, talk about your pie history. You know, what were you doing when you started making pie? I remember I met you when you were kind of traveling around the country, setting up little pie stands. That's right. Well, obviously I got into all of these arts for the money. (laughs) Yeah. Um, (laughs) And you met me at a time when I had lost my apartment in Seattle to a rent hike, actually. That's why I was traveling around. Um, So I was using pie as a way to make friends, as a way to figure out what do I do next with my life, and as a way to make a little dough. Ha ha. Ha ha. (laughs) (laughs) figure out all of these things but I guess I had you know uh, a somewhat similar um, revelation um, that Lauren had um, in that early on when I started baking pie and I was posting images of these pie or writing about pie on an old blog that I had I just noticed that people really cared about it Hmm. Um, and I got really curious about why why this particular food? Why did people respond so kind of over the top? Why could I be forgiven for being two hours late if I brought a pie? All these questions. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing that really got me into pie actually has been a long-term obsession with fruit. My family has always um, uh, grown fruit, uh, preserved fruit, um, eaten fruit. They made me go pick blueberries in the middle you know, of the summer. That was our, that was our chore. Um, And pie really seemed like the ideal way, the best way to serve fruit, just, you know, Mm -hmm. mess with it too much, wrap it in buttery pastry and call it good. Everybody's happy. So what are some answers to the first part of that question when you were asking yourself, you know, why can't I be forgiven for being two hours late? Why do people gravitate towards pie? What kind of things did you find out? Well, some of it is, I think um, it has... People know that the that easy the easiest pie is a cliche. Though pie can be easy, I think to most people it is not easy. And and people know that someone who has uh, walked in the room too late or, or, or two hours late with a pie was probably spending those two hours, maybe two hours in addition to that, making that pie for them. So that sense of of uh, the gift of this particular food stuff, I think, just comes comes with it for many people. Yeah. Uh, I. Oh, sorry. Are you done? Are you done? <laughs> well, I, mean, I think it's also just this really um, kind of expansive food form. I mean, just listening to Lauren talk about all the different inventions um, that she's been able to make with this frame of pies is, is fantastic. And is I think uh, really speaks to the appeal of this particular food form that you can, um, you know, it's a container that contains something. Yeah. And, mess around with those two things and make something new easily. Um, Can you just kind of explain a little bit when you were going around the country, like talk about what you were setting up because it was very sweet, literally. 
I was, yeah. So I was going to um, bar kitchens. I was going to private homes. Um, I was going into um, just basically whoever would have me. I mean, at one point I was, I set up backstage at Sasquatch Music Festival with um, a couple toaster ovens and was making pie on the spot um, wherever I had enough room to roll a pie out. Um, and then was either selling that pie or giving it away. And the occasion of eating pie would just bring out all sorts of people. Um, so it became, uh, again, just this opportunity to uh, go into places I normally, you know, wouldn't be invited um, and, <laughs> and serve people something that they were excited about eating. Yeah. So I was just listening to a podcast um, and the guest was cookbook author Julia Tertian. And like you, she also studied poetry when she was in school. And she was talking about the fact that she thought that writing a recipe actually felt quite similar to writing a poem. Like you have, you know, limits for sure. And the way that you kind of space things out. And I was wondering if you agree or disagree, if, if you find a similarity there. I need to I need to hear that podcast. I've actually never heard anyone else say that. I do think that maybe for some different reasons, but I guess I've thought about um, the re like a really good recipe is is pretty didactic. It tells you what to do. It's very commanding. It's very bossy, which is a tone I really enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> I can hear that inhabiting. Uh, but then I think it also needs to leave room for interpretation and leave and, and play on the senses and invite um, uh, just something beyond uh, simple instruction. Um, and a poetic form can be like that as well. I think um, we poets get really excited when we've got a really, really tiny box we have to pack something into that being given those limitations can actually be really inspiring and um, um, makes help you make something that you otherwise wouldn't make. So your new book is called The Book of Difficult Fruit. What is difficult fruit? What is this book about? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so this is a collection of essays. It goes from A to Z, Aronia to Zucchini, um, that uses unusual or unruly fruit to try to tell stories where what nurtures and what harms are entangled. So my operating metaphor is the blackberry bramble, which all of us on the west side of Washington State We'll be very familiar with that particular difficulty, the way that it offers, um, you know, free, beautiful, luscious fruit, but it also will completely take over anywhere you let it take over. Mm -hmm. um, a difficult, there's many different kinds of difficult fruit. Fruit can be difficult because it's not really edible. Um, it can be difficult because it isn't immediately edible. I think um, most of us grow up getting our fruit from the grocery store and kind of assuming that fruit falls within the parameters of whatever we can find at Albertsons, which, you know, if it's like a banana, that's kind of like a Snickers bar of the, of the produce aisle. It's you can true. Just <laughs> it, stuff it in your mouth and it's good to go and it's sweet. But there's a whole world of other fruit out there, like quince, for example. The very first time I had a quince, I felt so betrayed, actually, because I, I <laughs> thought that this really beautiful, really luscious smelling fruit was going to taste like it smelled. And anyone who's <laughs> a dummy like me and has done the same thing has probably had the same reaction, which is quince will just wick all the moisture out of your mouth. It's mm -hmm. super tannic. It is super sour. Um, and I think that just really invites us to uh, remember that though, you know, animals and, and plants really intersect at fruit, in that like animals are excited about fruit, eat fruit, and then spread the fruit's seeds and help the plant that way. There are lots of elements of the fruit that are just for itself, that are not for, they don't really care about humans, that don't care about human consumption at all. Um, and I was curious about learning about all of those fruits and mm -hmm. figuring out how to relate them um, in, in metaphoric and literal ways to my life and to moments in history that I think are interesting. So your book, um, your pie cookbook was where I made my first pie from. I'd never made pie. And we're going to talk about this later with everyone, because like you mentioned, pie is intimidating. People are afraid of crust. I don't know why. I think the same with pizza. People are afraid of making pizza at home. Um, and so I made a very lovely pie with a lattice top. And I will always just like feel a very strong connection to your book because of that. So I want to know what I know it's hard to choose, but what is your favorite pie? to make and what is your favorite pie to eat? Well, I'm, I mean, I'm a sucker for a double crust fruit pie, which is avoiding answering your question. 
Um, but if I, I mean, if I have quince, I would love an apple quince and pear pie, like sweetened mm. with honey. That is um, an amazing, amazing treat. Um, and then to eat, and I love to make that actually, we were talking about making. Now we're talking yeah. about eating. I love to eat a peach pie. And I love to eat a peach pie that's made, you know, in August, you know, the day after you get those peaches. Um, now, peach pie is difficult. Um, and peach peaches can be difficult because of their fragility. Um, so finding one just in just the right uh, window and, and having it on just the right day, that's the best experience. Well, now I feel like a teacher's pet because that's the pie I made from your book was oh, a peach pie yeah. in August. So <laughs> school what's that you graduated from high school I did I graduated <laughs> from high school all alone I turned my little bloop. um okay so questions for Kate like Kate Lebo make sure and leave them in the comment box we're gonna move to the next Kate Kate McDermott all the way in Port Angeles I'm feeling like a game show host more by the second um so Kate, when we had a meeting um, where we were all kind of behind the scenes talking about how this was going to go, I was saying a lot of people here are on to their second life, like their second career and pie. And the first was something totally different. And you said, no, 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 no. This is my third life. So could you kind of like give us like a brief run through of what brought you to the world of pie? I can. Um, it was totally unexpected. Um, I did start by making mud pies. When I was a little girl, uh, the pie maker in my family was my grandmother, Jeej, and uh, we loved her pies, um, and I used to just stand at the counter watching her. And um, so I, I learned a lot from her, not really even realizing that she was teaching me how to do it, which is how we learn so many things, which brings me to what my first career was. My mother was a pianist, so I learned to play, not really even realizing that I was learning a different language, which was um, how to, uh, I, I learned, I played before I spoke, I read music wow. before I read English. And by the age of 15, I worked as a professional musician as an accompanist. And so, you know, I was in that field for many, many years, but all along I was baking. I was always the one who was bringing cookies, cakes, pies, whatever, to school to celebrate a birthday or whatever. You know, in the, in the 60s and 70s, when it was like, we were like the back to the land thing, let's all learn to make bread. You know, I was just right there, uh, which was just wonderful. And I still love to make bread. So then um, I was in music for a long, long time, baking my way um, um, at the same time. And um, I was married and I had uh, my husband at the time, uh, my husband uh, yeah. said, um, can you make a pie? And I said, yeah. So I made one and I wanted it to be the best damn pie he'd ever had. So it actually, um, that first pie when he ate it, um, I didn't get that reaction. What I wanted oh. to hear was, my darling, you make the best pie. And what I heard was, um, maybe you could work on the crust. So, oh. <laughs> I see so, why he's your husband. Oh, well, he's not even, he's no longer with us either. Um, oh. But um, that being said, I spent two and a half years working on crust, on dough. I became enamored with it, sometimes making five different preparations of dough in a day just to see, does it need vodka? Does it need cream cheese? Does it need an egg or vinegar or whatever or not? And then when I settled on a recipe, then it was taking, um, uh, when I did the, I did a, a horizontal study of what it needed and then I did a vertical study. Okay, what happens if I use this fat and or this butter and this flour and uh, and then it became so specific of like when I was using uh, leaf lard, it was like, okay, what variety of pig is going to do? You know, so I just became wow. like this little pie geek. And one day he said, you know, I don't think this could get any better. I would have still loved to have heard, you know, oh, my darling. But that's okay. That's as close as we could get. So then uh, he was in the food world and said, um, I have some friends who would love to um, – uh, know how to make this pie. I said, sure, bring them over to the house. So those, uh, there were three people who came. There were two food writers and a chef. And at the end of that, uh, 
one of them, uh, they actually all said, you should be teaching this. Well, I knew how to teach because of my previous career in music. Now, at this point, I had been also working in PR and food PR, which is what he was in. And um, so I, um, I figured out how to make a website, put up some dates for some arbitrary classes, and stood back. And they filled. And they mm -hmm. continued to fill. And then the press came. So now this is 2008, 2009. Now I'm getting inquiries about, can you write a book? And at that point, I said, you know, I'm not ready to do that. I'm just like, um, if I had written Art of the Pie, my first book, then it would have been a very small book. I continued to teach uh, and teach all over the United States. I became like, this is now my third career, then became an itinerant time teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and um, at one point I got a, uh, now 2014, I get a communication from what is now my publisher in New York said, we see you're going to be teaching in New York. Would you come and see us? And I looked at the address and it was 505th Avenue. I thought, well, I don't think it gets much better than that. So um, I, um, I, I went, I had a conversation with what is now my editor, and they just kept saying, tell us more stories, tell us more stories, tell us more stories. And so I did, and I, uh, that, uh, out of that came R the Pie, which did extremely well. It went into six printings in two years uh, and received, it was on everybody's, seemed to be on everybody's best of and awards uh, you know, all over the place. And then I wrote a second book at their request. And then I wrote a third book at their request. Um, and I continued to teach through all of this, turning the, you know, I think the corner of the fourth career is becoming, realizing that now I'm not only a teacher and a teacher of pie making, but I'm a writer. And yeah. uh, that is something I, I never could have predicted none of this. And especially when my high school English teacher, when I would write my papers and get the same darn grade on each one of them. And I just thought, well, this is, this is not writing is something that's just not my thing mm -hmm. yet. It apparently uh, never say never because um, I'm, I'm really enjoying it, and I feel like it's a craft that I continue to learn about. All of this, I continue to become fat. I'm continuing, I continue to be fascinated with pie, and I continue to learn about writing and pie and life. Well, you have another title as well. You also identify as a pie chiatrist. <laughs> I do. I do. Yes, yes. I love a good yes. pun. And so what does that mean? What is the job of a pie chiatrist? Well, she answers questions about pie or life. Okay. So if you do have a life question or a pie question, I would be I would do my best to answer you. Do those I, intersect I mean, ever? Pardon? Do they? Oh, yes, <laughs> they do. Yes, they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember a particular one that's kind of juicy where they intersected a problem I you do. helped solve? Um, I do. Um, I had um, I had a student once. Uh, this is probably in 2010, 2011. And um, about three months after the class, I got an email from him. And he said, uh, my pies, his pies are getting me offers to father babies. So um, I thought, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it's, I remember, I, you know, I think the thing for me is teaching, uh, you know, that's sort of a humorous thing of what, what he was expressing to me. But what I have found in teaching is your privilege to be witness to seeing people's vulnerabilities and their strengths mm -hmm. uh, and their weaknesses when they come to that baking counter as you know, they're, they say, I've never made a pie, I can't make a pie. And it's what I feel that uh, as a teacher like Kate, um, it is my privilege and honor to be able to dispel that myth that you can't, yes, you can. And to see them in the process 
of the hours that we spend together, move beyond fear, and realize that it's more than just the ingredients in the set of directions. What they're doing is putting their heart into their work and seeing that every pie, every pie made with intention and love is the most beautiful thing in the world. Oh, I love that. Okay, so I'm going to ask some questions now that kind of anybody can answer. You can jump in. Um, we'll just see who goes first. Don't be shy because then we'll have weird, awkward silence. Um, so my favorite question, because we did ask people in advance of this uh, when they registered to come to this talk, uh, if they had any questions. And my favorite question was, why are pies round? Um, and we could talk about this with pizza and sweet pie. It was something I never thought about before. It's just, you know, because they are, they're just round. But I mean, they could be any shape. Do any of you know why they've taken on this shape? Is yeah, it, Dave, go ahead. So it bakes more evenly? This is not a quiz. I don't know the answer. Oh, well, I <laughs> That would make sense just because you have the heat permeating in evenly um, in all directions. Um, but I, I don't know the actual answer. Does anyone know the answer? I have okay. some thoughts on it. The, um, if you have a round pie, um, everybody's getting a piece of the crust on the edge. Mm -hmm. If you have a square pie or a rectangular pie or whatever shape, uh, the larger ones, you're not going to get that lovely crust on the edge. And pies can be any shape. We in our country, in the United States, we sort of American pies are round. That's how we see them. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the definition of a pie um, I think I think we all would would recognize what a pie looks like, and mostly it's round in our country, but it doesn't yeah. need to be round. Yeah, I think you're right, though. It's just like you know, some people like a middle piece when you have a lasagna, and some like the edge. But everybody wants some of the crust on a pie, and you wouldn't get any if you're in the middle. Um, okay, this is another question a lot of people ask, and and I've always wondered about this too. And you might all have a different opinion. So of course you can make pie crust with butter, lard, shortening, oil. Um, what is your favorite slash, you know, how do you, people always want the tender and flaky. Can you get tender and flaky at the same time? What, what do you think makes the best pie? And, you know, can you get a good pie out of any of those options? Well, Kate McDermott turned me on to half butter, half lard. When was that, Kate? Like 2008 or 2009? I think so never look back. I mean, that is that is the best. And you get that tender and you get that flaky. I teach with um, all butter only because it's a lot easier to find wherever I am. It's the mm. only reason. Um, I use all butter, uh, both for flavor and also practicality. So it's just one less ingredient to buy if I use all butter. And I find that it generally, the dough stays a little more solid and malleable longer. It's not quite as tender as say a dough with lard. And so for some of my designs that require a little more time or you know the woven pie tops, um, all butter tends to work better for me. Mm. I'm a terrible Jew and I love lard in my pie crust. But, <laughs> I'm a uh, bad Jew too. <laughs> I'm only half Jew, so. Is that <laughs> That's why you do half lard, lard and half butter. Yeah. It. <laughs> exactly. Um, Dave, I didn't get to ask you what I asked the others. Um, do you have a favorite pizza? What is your favorite topping? Because I have to say your pepperoni pie at Breezy Town is my favorite because there are two layers of pepperoni. There's a layer under the cheese and then there are the, I call them pepperoni hot tubs, the ones that crisp up um, and get really crispy around the edge. And that's why they have to be greasy because you can't have an empty hot tub. But um, yeah, they nice. were so maligned by the internet. I, I don't understand what, yeah. Um, I, if I'm at Breezy, the pepperoni paint job, which is the one you're describing with um, goat cheese and jalapeno is a really good, uh, really good pizza to get. Um, things that are interesting to put on pizza, um, is somehow incorporating mustard sometimes is actually really good. Um, you wouldn't think Whoa. it. Is. Yeah, I know. Um, we, once we did a, a pizza called, uh, Celine Dijon, my artichoke heart <laughs> will go on. Um, and, uh, that was pretty good. Um, 
what else? I think then you need to do a rice of pepperoni, the San Francisco treat, and then you could have a sourdough crust, rice, and pepperoni. Doesn't sound good, but anything for the pun. Right. Yeah, I, I am. I am very partial to the pun. Same. Uh, okay, we're going to take some audience Q&A because there are so many. Um, okay, so let's start with this one. <laughs> okay, um, this question comes from Nancy. Why does my crust always shrink after the pre-bake? And anyone can jump in. Kate, do you want to take it or no, should we do it together? I think you're going to have a more thorough explanation. <laughs> okay, it's in here. It's sure. in pie crust that they do shrink. Yeah. And the only crusts that I have had that don't shrink are gluten-free crusts. Okay, but yeah. the thing there are some things that you can do to help it so that it doesn't shrink as much in a blind bake, and that would be uh, making sure that your dough is extremely well rested and freeze it after it's rolled out. Uh, let it rest and put it in the freezer so that you know you've got a half an hour deep freeze. I see you nod in your head there, uh, Lauren. Do you agree with this? Mm -hmm. I always freeze my pies or dough before baking. And then you've got to put uh, enough weights that they go up to the top. And when you're putting weights in, make sure that you don't put them directly on the dough like I did the very first time. Then you're picking beans out. But uh, you've got to put something in either, you know, parchment paper or a coffee filter or a flat-based coffee filter or, or uh, foil even, you know. But make sure that your weights are mimicking the filling that is in there to hold that crust down. Uh, a question specifically for Lauren. Um, Angela wants to know if you make your own powders. You had talked about um, using beet powder and blueberry and carrot. Are those things that you dehydrate yourself? Um, I've never actually made my own powder. I usually make my own fruit and vegetable juices or just, you know, juice them straight from the vegetable or fruit form. But um, I usually just purchase powders. Okay. And I'd seen in that video. So you'll make, when you make a juice, do you usually replace the water with that liquid? Mm -hmm. It's just a one for one substitution. Um, there's a question here. What is your best pie crust recipe? And I will say Sherry and everyone else go down to the bottom and buy one of these pie books because uh, that's the best way to get the best recipe from any of these pie makers. Um, let's do a pizza question. I've been curious about this as well because I've been seeing these cast iron pizza recipes popping up more and more over the past couple of years. Uh, Debbie wants to know, can a cast iron pan achieve the same results for a Detroit style pizza crust? And Dave, if you could first just talk about what a Detroit style pizza is. Sure. Um, so that's actually one of the common uh, misconceptions or mis pieces of misinformation regarding, oh, how is Chicago style made or, um, you know, or how is Detroit style made? Uh, Detroit style is pretty well known that they uh, they use blue steel pans um, that they say were like pans from the auto shops or whatever. Yeah. But I'm not sure how much I believe that. Regardless, lore is lore. Um, but um, people in Chicago will say that they use cast iron pizza pans and there's never been such a thing created. Like I looked for it for so long because I thought that that's what I was supposed to be using when I was, you know, in Argentina, just researching, you know, bored and researching how to make deep dish pizza. Um, but um, you can, you certainly can. Um, it's just going to heat differently because cast iron will retain a lot of heat. Um, during that, but it, you know, as long as your cast iron is seasoned, it, it'll, it'll be fine. Okay. Um, this is a question that was pretty common in the pre questions. And then, um, during the chat, I love this soggy bottom because I feel like it's a very great British bake off, uh, phrase. So could you chat about how to create a fruit pie without a soggy bottom crust? I'll start with that. If I could, I actually could not figure out for a long time why people were having an issue with the soggy bottom. Um, and, and because I think the way that I think about making pie, um, I know that I want uh, the raw dough and the raw filling to touch each other for as little time as possible, always. So I always have baked pies that way. That, in the end, is my, my tip is just make sure you've got your filling ready to go. You've got both of your pie crusts rolled out. One of them is trimmed and in the bottom of the pie pan, ready to go. Put your filling in there. Put your top crust on. Don't fuss about it too much. Get it in the oven before it sogs up that bottom crust. That's my secret. 
Kate, what's yours? Um, I would add to what you're doing is to make sure that you put a, uh, that your dough is still cold and that when it goes into a hot oven, that it, you really get a blast of heat on the bottom so that it sets that bottom crust and gets that uh, filling so that it's really uh, uh, baking uh, as soon as possible. A, a warm oven or a warm dough, everything just kind of, it says, you know, hey, I'm at the beach. Mm. No, I'm just chilling. I'm not chilling in the right way. I, I, you want that uh, cold dough, just hot oven, just bake it and get it, get it, that bottom done. So one of the questions in here is something that I actually never thought about. Now I'm wondering like if this is why I've had things go awry in the past. Does it matter what the pie plate is made of? Could you do glass, you know, those kind of like cheapy aluminum? Can you use anything or will you get different results? You can use anything. You just have to know the properties of them. And I think, uh, I know, Kate, you talk about it in your books. I talk about it in mine, Lauren. You probably mentioned that in yours. And, you know, so um, it's there. Right. Okay. I think some of the way I've seen you talk about it, I know the way that I think about it, too, is I want to dispel this idea that you have to have the perfect plate to make the perfect pie. Yeah. Different plates work. They just have different um they make different types of pie and just mm. know what's going on and do it on purpose if you can well yeah so if you have a cookbook and it doesn't specify i mean how do you know what pie you can make with what i mean do you just kind of google around or is is there a standard like can you make any pie in a glass pyrex yeah. dish yeah okay yeah. okay what are the what which would be more troublemaking like ones that are kind of like eh, or well, like flimsy picnic pl uh, pie plates i mean those are trouble yeah. even just taking them out of the oven i mean when i i would used to bake t uh, 25 pies at once for this event i do with my husband called pie and whiskey and every single year one of our volunteers would pick it up at the edges and just fold it on it <sighs> Yeah, I get one of those pies. We'd only have 24 pies then. So that's that's trouble. I'd stay away from those unless you want to be able to throw your pie plate away. And then in that place, use them. So I want you to talk someone out of being afraid of making a pie. I don't know why it seems to be one of the most intimidating, you know, foods. And when I finally made a crust, I was like, this wasn't so hard. I felt like I, all this pressure. So, you know, what's your elevator pitch for letting people have the confidence to to make a pie from scratch? You know, what I say to them is, if you have the best ingredients, if you have pie-worthy fruit that has flavor, and you're making uh, a recipe that has a well-tested recipe that, you know, you, you taste that, that filling and you just you want to have another bite, and maybe something happens in the bake, and you're going, oh, my gosh, well, get out the lasagna pan and just dump it in and you'll have the best crumble in the world and nobody's going to know and it's going to taste great. Exactly. Just pretend like you did it all on purpose, no matter how it turns out. Mm -hmm. The other thing I like child way. students is that, I mean, if things go wrong, it maybe cost you $5 in about 20 minutes to two hours of your life, depending on when it goes wrong. And you learn something from it. Yeah, exactly. Just do it again. It's fun. Lauren, do you have any tips as being someone who's made pies for a shorter amount of time? <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, you know, don't be deterred by mistakes because sometimes that's how you learn the best or learn the most. So, you know, maybe you're intimidated by pie dough and your first pie doesn't turn out that well. Some things are learned best by repetition and practice. So just making it over and over. That's I basically picked a recipe um, didn't watch any videos, but just kept making pie. And, you know, a lot of the tips and tricks that I give in the book are just learned from doing over and over and over. So, you know, just because it's not perfect the first time doesn't mean that you're terrible at pie or that you can't make pie or that dough isn't your thing. It's just the first attempt. Um, yeah. So practice <laughs> makes perfect sometimes. Dave, I'm curious, could you give some advice for like people who just have no special like restaurant kind of equipment, they just have a standard oven that goes up to, you know, maybe 500 degrees. What are the best tips for making pizza at home to make it taste the closest to how it would taste in a restaurant? Um, it, it really depends what style of pizza you're trying to make. Um, but I would say that getting a pizza stone is uh, or just I mean, honestly, just any like non-glazed tile uh, will work as well if you're 
a little cheaper. Uh, that's what I did in college. Um, will work just fine. Um, I started making pizza out of a corner store in Argentina that I was living in because I was on a very messed up study abroad program. <laughs> uh, you can make pizza anywhere um, with just about anything. Um, and, you know, yeah, my first pizzas weren't that great, but you're still giving people pizza and they'll love you for it. Um, you know, Although I, I will say I've never believed that there's no such thing as bad pizza or bad sex. I'm like, mm, there know, is, there definitely is. Uh, whoever yeah. says that hasn't had the bad version of whatever that thing is that they're, yes. uh, yeah. Um, but, you know, certainly when somebody makes you a pizza, um, it, you have to try real hard to make it terrible. Um, but regardless, it, it's just a fun process. I mean, for me, it's fun. It was fun learning. It was fun figuring out, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, each oven is really like its own, it's its own thing. You have to learn how to bake on, on every oven differently. Um, and so, you know, when, when, you know, I started in Argentina and, you know, I had, you know, this gas oven and it, it worked all right. And it was, you know, but then I, brought it back home to Chicago and I was, you know, it was totally different. And, you know, I, I just kind of had to relearn it. And then every time, you know, Windy City Pie moved out of, you know, my home kitchen to the commissary to, you know, and then we'd like change what our oven was because we thought, oh, well, you know, it'll be better or faster this way. It's like you you just learn how to make it work regardless of what it is. Um, yeah, you can cook anywhere. Can you give just two hard and fast kind of tips though? Is it like crank up the oven, get a pizza stone, like like two kind of things that people can just start doing? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely the pizza stone is is going to be big, even for uh, even for a pizza that you, like like deep dish, where um, you just really want to get that oven spring um, on your dough immediately. Um, otherwise, you're it, you know you have uncooked dough in the center. Um, and I don't know. What's it? Yeah, I mean, I would probably crank up that oven, make sure it's preheated. I mean, I don't know. You fed me those, but <laughs> <laughs> I know that's what's that's what's worked for me. Um, okay, so let's talk about alternative flours. There's been a lot of questions about people want um, gluten free crust, both when they're making pizza and pie. Um, do you have any tips for that? Any particular kind of grain that you found has worked better, or is it something you don't even really mess with yourself? I've been doing this for years. Um, I was diagnosed in um, 2006 with celiac disease. Mm. And as a baker, that was like, oh, well, what am I going to do now? So at that time, uh, there were no uh, off-the-shelf, all-purpose, gluten-free flours available. So I spent a year playing around with flours. And I ended up like, well, I, you know, one, one mix, I had seven different uh, gluten-free flours and starches. And it was a real pain to have to put those together all the time. Then I uh, pared it down to four. And now, quite frankly, uh, if I'm being totally honest, I went from uh, a really good gluten-free recipe that I have in, in my first book years later. Now there are good gluten-free, all-purpose, off-the-shelf bags. And I use those and I created a new recipe in my, uh, the last book I just uh, came out with that mm -hmm. uses that. And um, I've taken pies to uh, gatherings and people don't even know that they're gluten-free. Oh, wow. Is there a brand that you particularly recommend? Um, I use uh, either the King Arthur All Purpose or the Bob's Red Mill. Cool. And I love Great both of them. Tip. Yeah. yeah um, xanthan and guargum. Xanthan and guargums are your friend if you're doing gluten free. So. In a pizza crust. Yeah. Okay. Good tips. Um, okay, so just one more question before we leave. I just want to know we're in, you know, early, early spring. Um, what is a really, really good ingredient that is just coming into season right now that people should be using to make pies with? Is there anything happening yet? Too no. early, right? Okay. <laughs> Asparagus pie. <laughs> we're not Summer fruit that you stashed away in your freezer, hopefully. Yeah. The, the pie <laughs> through here, it's going to begin with rhubarb. Yes. 
Yeah. Lauren, what do you make um, in off seasons? What are your favorite? Do you have a lot of frozen fruit? Do you turn to like cream pies, mm -hmm. chocolate? <laughs> um, so when this whole pie journey started and I clearly couldn't keep up with the output, I had to purchase a little freezer for my basement. And so part of that space I use to freeze summer fruit at its peak. So stone fruit, cherries, peaches, plums, apricots, um, rhubarb, things like that. I will freeze and then kind of hoard them for seasons like now when we're kind of in between waiting for the good produce to come back um, and use that straight in the pie filling. Yeah, we call it the frozen, the frozen fruit season. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's the great thing for Dave. Pepperoni is always in season. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Um, everyone on our panel, Dave Lichterman, Lauren Coe, Kate Lebo, Kate McDermott. Again, you can buy their books or visit their restaurants, order, um, looking at the links below. Thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. Um, and you can watch all kinds of cooking shows at kcts9.org. Um, again, we encourage you to buy books, visit restaurants and donate, donate, because of course, KCTS is a nonprofit. So if you're not a member already, consider becoming a member, go to kcts9.org. Thank you everyone and have a great night and enjoy eating pie because I'm sure everybody is so hungry and wants a pie after this talk. Um, treat yourself. It's pie weekend. <laughs>